and then I had to go back and plant. And I had uh, I had uh, 12 of these trials in, in my state in 2011. So uh, here was my research sites in 2011. I actually had one up here that blew over in that high wind. But uh, I had 12 trials in 2011 in, in my state. This is my state. This is the uh, land of Lincoln. It's also the home state of President Obama because he spent a little time up here, but I'm uh, pretty sure he wasn't born in here. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look for a while, like you might come back to it. I, I don't know if that's good or bad. We're already broke. So I, at, these, at, at these 12 sites, I had different fungicides. I had some twin rows. I had some different hybrid comparisons, but I banded the fertility on all 12. And uh, it took us a month to plant these. So you know, I banded that fertility in wet soil, dry soil, cold soil, you name it. And in every site that I banded that fertility, I saw an enormous improvement in the emergence and early growth of the crop. Probably the best single treatment effect I've ever seen in my career, you know, short of killing a plant with glyphosate. <clears throat> so here's where the uh, till bar ran through without the fertility. Here's where the till bar ran through with the fertility. And uh, for you South Dakota farmers, this is what, or North Dakota farmers, sorry, this is what soil looks like. Um, this, this is a uh, 45 part per million malic 3 P test soil, which says you don't need any phosphate. There's a screaming improvement. And I saw this at every site. Now, uh, if you look at this row here, you, you know, I saw what I think is the single biggest problem that's limiting your crop productivity. It's what I call a plant left behind. See this guy right here at the standard technology? He emerged a, a day or two later and he's behind his neighbors. That's a plant left behind. Now, uh, normally I tell you this is a plant problem. I'd say, well, you know, you, you were plant too fast and you bounced over on a wheel track or you didn't have enough down pressure or something like that. Or I'd say it's a seed problem. You know, you, you, you had variable sizes of seed and some of them were big or small or flat. But uh, my research <coughs> plant is running a mile and a half an hour and I get what's called plot seed. So if you ever get your hands on a generic looking bag that says plot seed, oh, it's the very best. It's all sized perfectly, tremendous germ. So it's not a plant problem, it's not a seed problem. So then I figure, well, you know, there, there, there must be an ice cube or something left under that seed. Um, never catch up. There's not a single thing you can do to this plant to make it catch up. I mean, you can coddle it. You can go out there and you can sing to it. You can hug it. You can piss on it. <laughs> I've, I've tried it. It never catches up. And in a, uh, in a pregnant dog weather here, man, it's a weed to these two. I'll tell you. I didn't get my money's worth on that seat. But when I banded that fertility under the row, even at 45,000 plants per acre, I had virtually no plants left behind. I mean, these plants are out of the ground, out of the hell. Apparently, plants sense their fertility earlier than we think, and they make irrevocable growth decisions. And if you hark and yield to a horse race, you know, in horse racing, you could use a strategy called save and drown. So you kind of sit in the back of the pack and win the race at the bitter end. I can't tell you how often that strategy has hurt me. But uh, in corn, if you in, 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 in yield of corn race, there's no save and drown. You, know, you can never make up for lost yield. You better lead the race right out of the ground because once you look, once you fall back, you can never make it up. And in 2011, right out of the ground, man, I had 300 bushels. Now, 2011's weather in general. It was wet and cold early. And so wet and cold early means the roots aren't happy and the uh, nutrients aren't available and nitrogen's uh, being lost. Wet and cold early. But then it, uh, then it uh, warmed up in May. We got perfect rain, perfect June. And then the rain stopped at the end of June. I didn't see another drop the rest of the year. And I thought that was bad until, well, in, in the next year it stopped at the end of May. I didn't see another drop. So in other words, in 2011, if I had not made a yield by the end of June, I wasn't going to make it or later, because the, the environment just kind of put a cap on it. And I had 300 bushels out of the ground in 2011. And I had, I had 12 of these sites out in my state. Here's the 12 sites. Um, some, of them, some of them, I just had an irrigated site, and, and, and uh, most of them were hybrid comparisons. And what, what I'm going to show you for each of these 12 sites is the difference in yield between the high tech and the standard package. And in 2011, on average, the high-tech package yielded 26 bushels more than the standard. Okay, that's not as good as the 50 bushels that I saw in 9 and 10, the better years, 
I blame the weather. <clears throat> but uh, there, there was a range. It ranged from a slight yield increase at the driest site, you know, to a whopping yield increase at the sites where I caught a little bit of high wind rain. Now, which factor, which factor or factors do you think was largely responsible for the 26 bushel yield increase in 2011? Well, that was those that acted at the very beginning. I, I'm just going to summarize all 12 here because you'll get bored faster. I still got a couple hundred slides to go. I'm going to get paid on the slide, I'm told. Uh, so, um, there's the 26 bushel, uh, so I have them all together. There's the 26 bushel yield increase over those 12 sites. And the uh, superstar in 2011 was that, was that extra fertility. Man, when I had that extra fertility alone, I gained 14 bushels. And when I left it out of the iTech package, I lost 17. I remember it was wet and cold early, and that means the roots aren't happy. So that extra fertility really helped. That was a superstar. Um, nitrogen, the extra nitrogen was, uh, was number two. When I, when I had extra nitrogen, it was weather protected. I gained eight bushels alone, and I lost 11 when I left it out of the high tech package. Now, when I didn't see a drop of rain after the end of June, boy, I didn't have a lot of leaf disease, and the fungicide alone didn't help me all that much. Only were three. But when I left it out of the high tech package, I lost eight. Not as big as I'd seen in better years, but still would have been enough to pay. Now, on the population side, when I had 45,000 plants per acre, it was too many, and I lost 10 more. Uh, on the high tech side, it didn't matter if it was 45 or 32, it was a wash. And, and that's because I didn't have the weather in July and August to be able to respond to those extra plants. And then on the genetic side, remember that uh, this is a workhorse hybrid in the standard, it's a racehorse hybrid in the high tech. So when I took a workhorse hybrid and I put it in the high tech system, I lost nine bushels. But when I took a racehorse hybrid and I put it in the standard system, I gained four bushels. So it's better to error on the racehorse side than the workhorse side. And happily, when I read the seed catalog, they're all racehorses, so that makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> From now on, I'm only going to use racehorses. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you the 2012 data because it was a real pregnant dog, I'll tell you. And the only thing that mattered in 2012 was if I had irrigation. So I'm going to skip that. And I'm, I'm going to summarize part, and then I'm going to talk about soybean. So, you know, just when I put a conclusion up here, don't shut down. It's not ready for, we're not eating yet, I got a few more. So on the corn side, for maximum yield, you're going to have to have a systems approach. There's about one single thing that you're going to do to bring it to the next field level. Now, if you're doing something wrong, it can be corrected. But, but I hate to tell you, there's no magic bullet. There's no one thing that's going to hit the home run for high yield. It's going to have to be a combination of things working together. Now, the, uh, the, 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 the problem is, uh, since the fact or factors that has the biggest impact on a given year, it depends on that year's weather. And since I don't do a very good job of predicting the weather, I pretty much have to have a whole package. <laughs> I mean, if, if you think about it, the high yield doesn't happen by accident, it happens by planning. And uh, you know, sometimes I have, to, I have to plan around bad weather, or better yet, I have to have the, everything in place when I get the good weather. Now, I'm pretty sure, despite the high seed cost, the plant population is the key to the whole thing. Population is the foundation for yield, but you're going to have to commit to it. You're going to have to have the right hybrid, you're going to have to feed it, you're going to have to protect it. So. Uh, I'll take a question on corn if you have one before I move on to soybean. I don't have as much stuff with soybean. Yes, sir. Well, how come it's so hard to get larger ears in the cob? I mean, like more kernels per cob. So the question is, how, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there's, the, the, the question is, how come it's how come I can't get a thousand kernels on every cob? Because that's the uh, that you get, you've ever counted silts. So if you want to get out and know how many potential kernels are on every plant, count the silts. And, he, and there's the potential for about a thousand on every cob, but uh, the kernel abortion is the is the problem. I mean, some of them just don't develop. They, they sense their environment, they don't develop. I mean, I, I had a bright idea when I was young. I said, well, geez, you know, this plant that has one ear, I'll just make it a two ears. You know, double the yield. I mean, well, how have molds ever thought of this? I couldn't believe it. You know, and. and uh, Apparently, apparently, if I'm selling seed, that's not the right approach <coughs> to, to use. It's a, there's only so many resources to go around, I hate to tell you. I wish I could, I wish I could make more kernels on the, on the cob. But say, like, uh, years ago, and we raised corn for, I don't know, forever, but we used to always have, like, uh, four to 500 kernels per cob, you know, in uh, 25, 30 years ago, and we, 
Now we can probably get up to 600, but that's a 40 years ago we raised. But I mean, now we're planting 32,000 population, and 40 years ago, or 20, 30 years ago, we planted uh, 20,000. Yeah, but, well, the recent years were bigger, the longer ones, the because you had less plants. I mean, it's a trade off between how many plants and how many kernels are on every plant. And I think a lot of it's management. Remember, you've got to have the nutrients available, you've got to have weeds not there, you've got to have the right weather, you've got to have nothing chewing on the roots. So uh, a lot of getting more kernels on every plant is to, to commit to it and manage it. Other question before I move on? Are you answer, Dean? Yes, sir. You've talked a lot about, mostly about uh, achieving a better yield, but what about the economic side? Of it? Yep, yep, so I, I get this question a, a lot. What about the economic side? I'm gonna let Mike answer this, but uh, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a biologist, so uh, I, I'm not concerned about the economics. Remember, I get these inputs for free. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what I'm showing you is not a recommendation. You're gonna have to work with the Arthur Company's agronomists who know what these things cost and, and know what, 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 uh, you know, what your comfort level is. Uh, you know, and, and if I could get $8 for it, I'll pay. You know, I mean, that, so I can't tell you for certain, and that, that wasn't my goal. And I'm trying to push the upper limit. So, I mean, that's why you got the, the money guy and the biology guy here together. <clears throat> you know, maybe, maybe we'll work on this later and come up with an answer after the third beer, right? <clears throat> I should do it. <laughs> Anything else? Well, I'm gonna stick around. I got nowhere to go tonight, so you can talk to me later. <clears throat> but let's move on to soybean. Same concept, uh, a little different name. Uh, again, I want to know those factors that have the biggest impact on soybean productivity, and hence the six secrets of soybean success. <coughs> and, and this started because the uh, Illinois Soybean Association, you know, your checkoff dollars at work, they, they came to me and they said, well, I kind of like that 700 stuff. We'd like to make uh, soybean yield uh, sexy. And I said, well, if you want to make it sexy, make it secret. And, you know, hence the six secrets of success. And I'm not very good at keeping secret, I'm going to tell it to you. But um, now, now, just like uh, well, well, just like I showed you for for the corn, there's some prerequisites for soybean. I mean, drainage of soybean is even more important than corn. Soybean makes that wet feed. Can't grow soybean in floodplain. And uh, you know, weed control is crucial for soybean. Now, what, what I used to like to do is let the weeds grow up, and then I hit them once with glyphosate, and the field would be clean at the end of the year when I was harvesting. But uh, pretty sure I'd lost a lot of yield in the, in the meantime. So. Uh, weed control is essential. And uh, I'll, I'll, you'll notice I have a slightly different prerequisite for soybean, and you'll see the reason why that is. But uh, on the soil side, I'm, I'm more concerned about the pH for soybean. When, when you're lying on the soil or when you're trying to decrease the soil pH, it's all about the soybean way more than it is about the corn. So these are the prerequisites. Now, there's a couple of good things about soybean that are not secrets, but uh, if you were paying attention, you, you, you learned there's a few good things about soybean for my previous, for, for my next year's corn. In other words, if, if I grew soybeans the previous crop, my corn plant's 25 bushel happier the next year. And I just showed you that soybean, because of its taproot, can improve soil tilth compared to corn. So those are advantages of soybean, which are not secrets. Now I'm going to go through each of the secrets, and I, I haven't worked on this enough, so I, I can't really put a bushel per acre value on each of the soybean secrets like I can for a corn. But I've, uh, I've ranked them, and I, and I did this by understanding the biology of the soybean plant. And then I actually read some of the scientific literature, which basically means I made them up. But um, <laughs> just like corn, weather's number one for soybean. Because what well, soybean likes different weather than corn. So the perfect weather for soybean is, well, I want it warm and moist in, in the spring. I, I need just enough rain to keep me by in, in, in uh, June, July. You know, soybean's got that tamper. But what I really need for soybean in, is I need the rain in August. And soybean likes a lot hotter temperature in August than does corn does. So rain, hot, doesn't hurt soybean at all. In other words, I, I can have a record high soybean yield year and a record low corn year because they like different weather. <coughs> so weather's number one. And uh, what's number two? And I think this is the one that's going to surprise you a little bit. Um, the, the number two is a prerequisite for corn, but it, uh, it's number two for soybean. And that is fertility. Why they overlooked? And there's three reasons that, uh, that uh, fertility is number two for soybean. Well, one of them has to do with the fact that you don't fertilize your soybean. <clears throat> in, in my state, I, I, I try to fertilize the part crop, I, and I delude myself into thinking I'm putting twice the 
the amount of fertilizer on my fertilized barn. So um, one reason fertility is number two is you're not fertilizing it. Uh, another reason, as I'm trying to show you, is that when you are fertilizing it, um, you, you, have the, you have the main limiting nutrient wrong. And then the uh, third reason you don't fertilize soybean is, remember, it's some of it's nitrogen from the atmosphere, from the nodules. So you know, there's nodules on soybean. You can pull these suckers up. And those nodules are a symbiotic association between soil, bacteria, and the plant. And so uh, in a symbiotic situ situation, both parties benefit. So the plant gives the nodules sugar, and then the nodules, as their pink inside, they give the plant some of the nitrogen it needs from the atmosphere. And this is called fixation. When you take a gas out of the atmosphere, it's called the fixation. This is biological fixation. And the key is some, about half the nitrogen in the plant comes, in the soybean plant, comes from the nodule. And soybean has a very high nitrogen requirement because of the high level of protein in soybean seed. So again, I'll show you, this is, uh, this is uh, for some of, some of the macronutrients of soybean, uh, how much of each of these, uh, these macronutrients are in a 60, 60 to bushel soybean crop. Again, we measured this last year. And, and uh, I'm showing the same thing. This is how much it's taken, you have to have in the crop. This is how much is removed with the grain. There's the harvest index. So in other words, a, a 60 to bushel soybean crop has to have 270 pounds of nitrogen from the nodules and the soil. And it removes almost 200 pounds of nitrogen in the seed. That, that seed does a high growth concentration. So uh, remember I said it gets some of its nitrogen fixation, about half. So in other words, of this 270 pounds, about 130 of it comes from the nodules. The other 130 has to come from the soil. And uh, here's a problem, you can't have your cake in either too. You don't have to if you fertilize soybean, you shut the nozzles right down. So that uh, the nitrogen that comes from the soil has to be sort of slowly released from the earth, from the organic matter, from the previous corn residue. It gets some, it gets 130 pounds of nitrogen from the air, but it removes almost 200 with the seed. So here's another common misconception. Soybean does not add nitrogen to the soil. It removes it. All right, a lot of people think, well, for every bushel of soybean I grow, I got to get a credit of a, of a pound of that. It needs to be a pound of that in the soil. It's exactly the opposite. You grow a 70 bushel soybean crop, and you're removing 70 pounds of that or more from the soil. Soybean does not add it in the soil. It removes it. And the higher the yield, the more it removes. Now, now again, uh, so, soybean is a fairly high potassium requirement, and, and, and as, a, as opposed to corn, soybean removes more potassium in the seed than does corn. There's a higher concentration. So I'm gonna, I know this is going to be complicated. You're almost losing it, but uh, we're close. Uh, I, I'm going to compare. I'm going to compare 62 bushel soybean to 230 bushel corn. And again, I'm showing you the required to produce the remover to grain, the harvest index. And so a 62 bushel soybean crop actually has 25 pounds more in it than does corn, and actually removes almost 50 pounds more in from the field than does corn. Now both uh, both the corn and a soybean crop have the same amount of potassium in it. So same amount of potassium in 62 bushel soybean and 230 bushel corn. And the soybean crop actually removes almost 25 pounds more potassium than does corn. And I think here's where sort the of thinking that uh, soybean needs potassium uh, comes in. So it, it, it's, it's, it's 25 pounds more removed with, the, so for, with soil and corn. But guess what? If uh, my corn crop, if I fertilize my corn crop, and I got 180 pounds of potassium in the corn crop, and I only remove 60, that means I have 120 pounds of potassium in the corn stover. Now, if you call it trash, it doesn't seem quite as useful. You know, I mean, but there's 120 pounds of potassium, and it's not trash, I'll tell you. You know, if somebody's going to give you 30 bucks a ton to remove that to make biofuel out of it, bad move. You're probably giving up $70 worth of potassium. There's enough potassium in the corn stover to supply two thirds of the names of the next year's soybean crop. The problem is phosphorus. So again, remember, I put the 250 pounds of map on my corn crop. It took it all up. I removed 80% of it, which means there's 20 pounds left for next year's soybean which needs 50. 
So I already got to take 30 out. And the soybean crop removes 40. So that means every year I'm in a corn and soybean rotation. I'm actually mining the soil 20 pounds for phosphorus. It's phosphorus which is the most limiting element for soybean yield because of the way we're fertilizing our corn. Now, I'll, I'll try and prove this to you. I'm going to show you the pattern of uptake of potassium and of phosphorus. So if I show you potassium uptake, same thing I showed you before. This is how much potassium is in the crop as a function of time, different parts of the crop. So that 62 bushel soybean crop has to take up 180 pounds of potassium. And, and roughly, if you look here, it's done taking it up by 80 days after flowering, you know, just before the seeds start to fill. And the great bulk of that potassium that's in the soybean crop is in the stem and the leaf petioles. See that there? In fact, in fact, there's so much potassium in the stem and leaf petioles that all of the needs of the seed can be met by taking it out of the stem and the petiole. Now, I want you to look at this pattern of uptake. Here's the text and when it stops, and where it is. And I want, to, I, want to, I want you to compare that to phosphorus. Phosphorus has to be taken up for a longer time period. Oh, I mean, look at this all the way up to 100 days, up to our sixth growth stage. Has a way bigger seed requirement than does the task you can compare back to that. And you don't have this uh, reservoir in the stem. You've got to take this up to the roof. This is probably the most limiting element for soybean yields because of the way that we're currently uh, fertilizing. That's why it's number two. So it's number three. Uh, same issue with corn, you know, I mean, it's variety. I mean, I, I agonized for hours and hours on my corn variety, and I could get a damn what soybean variety I plant. You know, is it round? I'm trying to plant it, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're not equal either, I'll, I'll tell you. And, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you 10 soybean varieties in my location with my high-tech management. And with high-tech management, allegedly I've removed all of the other limiting factors except for the variety. So I'll, I'll show you 10 varieties under my high-tech management uh, system uh, last year. And, uh, and they ranged in yield from 54 and a half to 66 bushels. There's a 12 bushel yield swing on selecting the right variety. Now, guess what? Half of these are Roundup 1 and half of these are Roundup 2. Which ones do you think are Roundup 1 and which ones do you think are Roundup 2? I wouldn't believe this if I didn't see it. But Roundup 1, Roundup 2. Roundup 1, Roundup 2. And this is different seed brands of Roundup 1. You know, and, and that explains why just yesterday, Pioneer and Monsanto finally got together. And now Pioneer is going to be able to use Roundup 2 because of this difference. You know, and, and when I have a 5 to 10 bushel difference between Roundup 1 and 2, man, I'm not going to bid on Roundup 1 because there's a big difference in yield according to the variety. Now, uh, what's number four? Now, I want you to think about the growth of the soybean crop. Soybean is indeterminate in its growth. So it's got 19 nodes in pods, and it's the leaf at the closest node that provides the energy for the pods and beans that node. So therefore, you've got to protect the photosynthetic capability of that, of every one of those leaves that has pods at that node. So foliar protection. Here I'm largely talking about uh, diseases or, or, or insecticides, or I don't know, maybe you've got your magic stress relief growth regulator. Um, and, and one of the reasons that foliar protection is so important is, is because of the yield components of, of soybean. If I look at the yield component of soybean, uh, this is what it looks like, the pod number, and the soybean branches, so, so how many pods you have. It's pod number times seeds per pod. And the, uh, the pod number and the seeds per pod is a function of weather, fertility. Well, pod number is a function of weather, fertility, and genetics. They interact. <coughs> seeds per pod, that's primarily a function of genetics. I mean, I can't tell you how much time I spent looking for that five bean pod. You know, I don't know if, I, if I found that one when it was bad, valuable, I wouldn't be here. Um, so that's a genetic factor. And then once I have all those pods and seed, then I have to fill them. That's, you know, I, I think get their way. And that's where the foliar protection comes in. Protecting the photosynthetic capability of each leaf. So I modeled here for you, I've shown you how important seed weight is uh, to soybean, to soybean yield. 
I, I've shown you the impact of increasing the seed weight on soybean yield for fairly decent yields, where I've held the, the uh, seed number constant. You, you know how many times I've harvested soybean and they're all babies, you know, and I thought I had a great deal looking at it, but uh, I didn't fill those seed out. And that's because I didn't protect those leaves. And so if I, uh, if I look at the constant number of seed, 293 per square feet, that's what it takes to grow 70 bushels of soybean. That's 12 and a half million seed per acre, by the way. So if you don't, don't try to count on those. <coughs> and then, then uh, what I need to do is I need to protect the capability of each leaf. So if I change the seed weight to 2 milligrams, that's a bushel. If I change to 10 milligrams, that's 5 bushels. And that's why foliar protection is so important. Number, number five, uh, this is seed treatment. And uh, you know, the uh, sky's the limit in seed treatment. That could be an inoculum. I could have a growth regulator. Okay, the seed treatment I'm going to talk about is protected from disease, insects, and nematodes. And seed treatment is particularly going to be important if I want to plant early. And uh, this, uh, last year at my site, this was by far the most visual impact that I saw. And so I'll show you an example here. Um, here, here here's an untreated seed. It's called naked seed. I kind of like the sound of that, but uh, not when I'm growing it. <clears throat> and here's the uh, complete seed treatment. You can see I got a little, a little disease here. These look a lot better. <coughs> this is what I saw at my site. This is by far the thing I saw um, 